Good evening, everybody. Um, just wanted to welcome you all and thank you all for being here. Um, I'll be doing my presentation in a bit, but I wanted to come up and um, introduce and welcome. First, well, I'm going to be introducing April, but also to welcome you all to the territory. And I'll be elaborating a bit more on what that means in my presentation and explaining that for those that uh, might be learning about that for the first time. So I come from the Squamish or Squamish people, and I grew up in North Vancouver um, on the Homolchton community. Um, which the Indian agents decided to call Capilano Indian Reserve Number no. 5. Um, and I grew up there. I also grew up in Aslahan, which is located north of Vancouver, and the Indian agents decided to call that Mission Indian Reserve Number no. 1. And um, so my people have, have lived here for countless generations, and I call this place home. But more importantly than that, this territory, including where we're at right now, um, the Broad Inlet, Falls Creek, English Bay, um, has been the home for not just my people, the Squamish people, but also the Tleilwet Oath and the Humatquim people, who are our relatives and we have many deep, um, long connections to. And so this territory is uh, considered, we call it shared territory, but it's, you can imagine, you know, multiple families living in the same area that would share the same resources, um, have connections between each other, cultural connections, as well as history. And so uh, I welcome you all to the territory, welcome you all to being here on our traditional unceded, occupied, stolen territory, <laughs> whatever other uh, adjective I can find that I'll introduce there that I'll put it into. Um, but I, I am really glad and honored and thank Am for um, inviting me to be here and inviting me to do this. It's been an interesting journey over the past few years. Um, coming to this point, it was interesting as I started working on my presentation, I thought that it would take a lot of work, but I think there's been a lot that I've learned over the past few years that when I started writing the presentation, it all came together very easily. So um, I wanna introduce April Charlo, who's a friend of mine that I met many years ago um, who has also been doing work around language revitalization, but also research into the ways in which um, our languages have become colonized. And so as we attempt to revitalize them, she's been doing a lot of really interesting research about that and investigating that from a very um, de decolonizing perspective and an, and an attempt to investigate the ways in which our concepts and, and our ideas around language um, and how those have been adopted or assimilated or appropriated from English and how that's affecting our people today. Um, but more importantly, she's been doing some really amazing work. Um, she's been an inspiration for my, myself. For a long time, I was um, only viewing myself as a Squamish language practitioner and that my goal in life was to revitalize the Squamish language because I am Squamish, I'm Squamish. And uh, she impressed me um, a few years ago, and she'll talk about it, I imagine. We've done this thing where we don't know each, what each other's going to say, so I don't know anything about her presentation. She doesn't know anything about my presentation, so we're going to surprise each other. But um, she decided on her own to work with a language that's not from her ancestry. It's the language of her neighbors, a language that's, from, from what I understand, completely different than her ancestral language. And she felt that, from what she shared with me, is that that language is in such a dire need to be revitalized. Her language was, you know, okay, but that language needed help. And so she went and worked with another language that's facing extinction. And, you know, for a lot of our people working in language revitalization, we kind of silo ourselves. We think of ourselves as, my work is only exclusively going to be with my language. And she made a choice to, you know, help her neighbors. And so that was a big inspiration for me and kind of the choices I've made um, since then and what I've planned to do and the way in which I articulate the need to revitalize not just my language, but all indigenous languages and my belief in that it can be possible. And so she's been an inspiration for me. I'm really glad to and happy to introduce April Charlo, who will be um, giving us the first presentation. Thank you. So everything that he just said was wrong because it was very colonized way of introducing me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> kidding. We, we do this all day. We're like, what you just said, or what did he say? I was like, roll your window up. And he's like, that was very colonized of you to say. <laughs> okay. So um, thank you for that, for that awesome introduction. And thank you all for coming and Am for, for having uh, the, the opportunity to do this. This is something that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I was hoping he would give a little, well, he did, he did a great job on, on giving you some um, background about myself, but I am from the Flathead Reservation in Northwest Montana. 
Um, I am a member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. So we have two tribes on my reservation. I was not born into the language and neither was my dad. So let's just, let's begin. I don't have a lot of time, so let's just get going. Because they put me on a time limit. How colonized is that? <laughs> Shouldn't be on a time limit. So it's the wrong date, ignore that. So um, I'm just gonna kind of give a background, um, just kind of quickly, something that I discovered through my research, uh, I had to just go back to the beginning on where my head was at, where my thinking uh, came from and all that kind of stuff. So this is just kind of like going through um, my experience. So as, as human beings, this is kind of what happens is that we enter into existence, um, sometimes like that, boom. And we're kind of, we're kind of uh, perplexed. You know, we're kind of like, what is this world all about? You better pay attention, sit, you should get out there. You know, like, what, what is this world all about? You know, we're kind of concerned, you know, we're kind of like, you know, taking everything in. And, and as we do that, we, we start to develop concepts based on, based on our environment, based on the people in our environment. And then we start to develop uh, or be able to contextualize the world around us. And then once we get to a certain age, we begin to use the language that is in our environment to start to decode our experiences, the meaning that we're making in the world. We start to use this, the language that is in our environment. So that's just a very basic. Um, could go into more detail, but I won't because I don't have time. So, aww, that is my niece. And so, so I have the honor and the privilege and the responsibility to help shape this little girl's, uh, her concepts and how she contextualizes the world, how she makes meaning in the world. And this was very important to me. And so I was, um, and so I, at the, even at the same time, I was in a language uh, revitalization program where we were developing curriculum. And I was with the fluent speaker every day. And then I would go back and I would, um, you know, teach her all the language that I was taking. And so, but also I was instilling in her values and concepts that I had been instilled, that had been instilled in me. And I was passing along my experiences and my, how I made meaning in the world as well. So, so on this day, so I'm gonna tell a little story, um, just to, whatever. So I'm gonna tell the story about, on this day, she found a bug. Sarah Joan found this bug, and as you can tell, she is, how are we doing, Robert? Is this, is this good? Okay, good. Um, so on this day when she found this book, she was like, she was just enamored with it. And she, she always has been. She's always been really interested in bugs. And, um, and so you could tell she found it. And this little white part, the white part that's up there, that was a cup. Because on this day, she had found a bug. Naturally, with children at this age, this bug becomes her bug. Yeah? My bug. She kind of sounds like that. And so she, she took on this bug. And so... On this day, you know, she was, she was you know, saying, my bug, you know, I'm gonna have this bug, I'm gonna keep this bug, this bug is now mine, it's gonna live with me forever. And so, so what was going on was that these con the concepts, there was, there was mean she was making meaning of the world on this day, and so she was, she was of how she was contextualizing the world around her. And so, one of those, con one of those concepts I'm just gonna pull out was this concept of mine, my mind. And so with that, you know, with, and even in, in, my, in my upbringing and how I make meaning in the world, this my mind word, it's ownership. You know, it's staking claim to. You know, my niece did a staking claim to this bug. This bug is now hers. She went outside and, and in her mind and how she makes meaning with, with her environment is that she can stake claim to things and she can stake claims to, the, to this bug. Um, it is now, she, it is, you know, in her possession. She's gonna put it in that cup. I, I talked her out of it. She didn't keep the bug, right? Because I'm like, you can't, I'm sorry, honey, but we had to have a talk about that. And so just to give a little more uh, emphasis on, on this idea of ownership and how it operates in our life on a daily basis, we have your, your average chair. And so this is like, you know, so this average chair, this, this, is, this is also something that, um, in, in which we, we stake claim to on a daily basis. So let's say one of you leaves. And let's say the 100 people that were supposed to be here come in, you know, and, and, you're, and they, they're coming in there saying, you know, is, is, is that chair taken, right? Asking if, if, 
someone has staked claim to, this, to that chair, and then you might say, yes, that's, that's John's chair. So we're reinforcing this concept, and this is something that we have done to make meaning in the world around us, is, is this, uh, this constant um, reinforcement of ownership, and that we can stake claim to something as simple as a chair. And so again, you know, with my niece, so that day, I encouraged it. You know, I encouraged it because she said, look, Auntie, I found a bug. And I said, oh, you found a bug. She said, yes, it's my bug. And I said, oh, it's your bug? So I encouraged it. I encouraged that concept and how she makes meaning in the world by encouraging that, that, that indeed, um, you know, it's accepted it, indeed that you can state claim to a bug, that you can claim ownership to a bug. Because that was my, you know, that's, that was my understanding. Um, and so what, what was interesting is I also reinforced it with, with the concept of share. Because here I am, you know, thinking, um, you know, I'm, I'm instilling these values onto, you know, my niece and trying to shape her and trying to make her the best person, you know, possible. Because that's what we feel our, our, our responsibility in our life is with the children in our lives. And so on that day, like her, her, my nephew, her brother comes up and he says, hey, Sarah Joan, he's like, can I, can I play with your bug? And of course, what does she do? No, mine. You know, because we've seen this, right? We've seen this all the time with these, with our, with the kids in our life, is they, they take on this notion of ownership. And so, and so what do I do? I come in and I say, Sarah Joan, share your bug. So I'm again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm instilling the value, I'm hoping to instill the value of share and not be greedy and selfish, but I'm, I'm still reinforcing the concept of ownership that you can indeed own this bug. So then what happens is that we start to develop a consciousness of how, of how we think. And it just kind of sits with us. And so, so on just staying with this, um, with this world, OK. So <laughs> it's so neat. I see two slides up here, not to be distracted. But it's, it's nice to see it, because then I was like, oh, world view. Don't, don't say that yet. So what happens with, this, with our consciousness is it starts, as it starts to develop and set in, it starts to tell us about how we view the world and how we experience the world. It also tells us how we have a relationship with ourselves. And, and it also you know, starts to tell me about how I'm going to have a relationship with you, with others, in, in my environment, in my world. And it also, this consciousness also helps shape how I have a relationship with the land, how I have a relationship with the water, and how a relationship with the animals and, and nature. So, okay, now we're just gonna kind of switch gears a little bit. Um, and so that, you know, that, that was all leading up to this. Um, and, and this is my mindset up until last summer. And last summer I had the opportunity to help collaborate this camp called Kasanka Summer. And I went into it with the mindset, you know, with this, and I'm, I'm gonna stick with this idea of ownership. And so as I started to learn the Tanakh language, I inserted the concept of ownership. And so the, the concept of ownership, so, cause there's a word, there's a word, ka. And so in my mind, because of how I conceptualize the world, um, and how I've built, built meaning with this word my, is that my, you, so I, so I, and, I, and so I inserted my experiences and how I con contextualize the world onto this word ka. And so to me, this word ka, you know, to me, um, means my, my ownership that you can state claim to um, and that it's a possessive. That was my thinking. And then, um, and then it was amazing because this summer, um, this was one of the days, and I, I put this picture up there because this fluent speaker came down from Canada, from here, right, th from this country, right, I'm in Canada. She came down from, from this country because the Tanakha, there's an invisible border um, of the people. And so she came down to see what we're doing, and, and at this point I had learned enough language um, to, to, to visit her a little bit, and I wanted to show off. And so one of the things that I did is we were sitting close uh, you know, to a little table like this, and, and my water was on the table. And so I was like, oh, you know, I get to show off. And, and so what I said to her is I said, Hamatiksun kana pituk. And, and what I had told her is I said, hand me my water, so to speak. Um, 
And she kind of stopped and she looked at me and she said, well, you can't say that. And I said, well, you know, kind of taken back because you didn't, you know, me, what? I'm not wrong. Just kidding. That's very colonized of me to think that. And she said, you can't say that. And I said, what, what can't you say? You know, because I was like, what part, what? Because I, I had all the words right, you know, and I think I had it right that, you know, how I set it up in the, in the sentence structure. And she said, she said, you can't, you can't use... You can't use ka with anything in the natural world. And that just blew my mind. And it blew my mind so much that I just kind of let it go. You know, and that happens, that, that, that um, cognitive dissonance, where it was just too much. It was too much to, because I couldn't match it up with any of my experiences, any of my concepts, any of, you know, I, it just didn't, it didn't sink in. And I was like, what does she mean? You can't say anything in the natural world. Well, okay, so, uh, you know, what does that mean? And I kind of, you know, I was like, well, you know, how, how, about, how about, can we, can we say things, you know, like, you know, can we use it with car, you know? Can we use that car with, you know, with car, shoes, or money? Um, <laughs> I'm decolonizing the, shoe, the twice of the shoes. That's pretty funny. <laughs> As you can tell, I've changed my shoe attire. They, these used to be heels. I used to be all about heels. Today I'm not. Still remnants of my, okay, my shoe fetish. So, <laughs> so these were the things that I still thought, you know, because I was like, well, these things, these things aren't in the natural world, you know? You can, I'm sure you could still use the language and I could still say, you know, kashan, you know, things like that, you know, shoe, my shoe. And, and things like that. And we could still continue on, you know, with this revitalization effort and, you know, no harm, no foul, okay? So you just can't use it with napituk, you can't use it with water, you can't use it with rocks, um, you know, and as we're looking at the natural world, you know, basically things like that, you yeah? know? That's where I was at. I was like, oh, okay, just, just don't use it with anything like that. And so, uh, you know, I was totally fine with that and, and, and went along you know, my merry way through camp and still learning the language. Um, you know, the bomb didn't go off in my mind until this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and so last year, after the camp was over, I came, um, I came up here for a conference. And me and this guy, uh, you know, me and Khasilam, um, we talk language, and we, and, and we can have some really amazing conversations to even, and on this one, I really had to question myself and really um, humble myself to be like, I totally dismissed what she said, you know, because I was like, because we were such, we were, we were on such a roll that summer that, that I, I just, and I couldn't take in that you couldn't use ka in that way. And so when, when I was sitting there, and, and we were having a, a discussion about the language method that, that we work with, and and um, and, when, and the word colonization came up, and and we and we asked ourselves, well, do you think that maybe perhaps what we're doing could be a little colonized? And then all of a sudden it hit me that ka. This word, this word ka, you know, and I was like, oh my god, I don't, I don't know if ownership is the same thing that ka means. You can't say anything in the natural world, and then it went. And then I just kind of like you know you, when you have that, the, the, those those wake ups, those realizations that um, you know that awakening. And I was like natural world, and I and I was like wait, go back before the cars, go back before the shoes and the shoes, and <laughs> you know go back before those things existed. Money, go back before then. Everything, everything was in the natural world. And it just blew my mind. Boom. Just kidding. I never use that word. It's silly. Only when I type. Hashtag. Boom. <laughs> and, so, and so I realized, and I was like, wait a minute. Could the Tanakha language not have ownership? Because how it is used in the Tanakha language, it's the same as for, for the Salish language, for, for, for the language of my ancestors. So for us, that in, that's not in, or on, in and on. So that, that's how you say um, that my word in my language. And so what I did is when I went home, 
I just went and started visiting my elders because I was like, well, the Tanakh, I don't, they, you know, I've been using that word, like I've been using it in Salish, this word in and on, interchangeably with, you know, I can say, you know, in kreishin, I can say, you know, in pushin, you know, like my car, my this, my that. And then I was like, wait a minute, could, could that rule or whatever, I don't really like to call it rules, but could, is it possible that that concept of ownership and possessiveness also not exist in my Salish language? And so what I, what I found out, because, because these words exist, right? They're, they're out there. And, I, and it kind of makes sense now about how the mix-up happened. Because what this word is, for both the Tanakha and the Salish, and for many other tribes that I, that I researched and asked about, is that this word, it's not an ownership word. It's not a possessive word. It's not a stake and claim to word. It's a relationship word. When we say katiti, we say kama, and then when we say in mestem, in in tomb, my mom, my dad, my grandma, what we're, what we're saying is we're saying that I have a connection and a bond with this person. It doesn't mean I own my mom. It doesn't mean I own my dad. What it is doing is it's describing and it's, and it's telling us about this concept of in and on. And it's not one of ownership. And so, you know, for, from, from visiting with my elders about this concept and other people, this, this word in and on, um, I, I think what happened was is that, you know, because we've we seen, you know, we know that in our language that, that my means my mom, my dad. And then when we heard my mom and my dad in English, we're like, oh, that's where in, in goes. But then we didn't, I don't know if we realized the interchangeable way that it's used in English, that it then becomes an ownership and possessive word. And so it just kind of started to sneak its way in to where we're using it in that way that it's starting to become acceptable, and especially for me. And so, you know, why I did the whole setup onto the, my mindset was because here I am, like this language revitalizer person you know, where I'm a go-getter, you know, I, I'm so passionate, so passionate about revitalizing my language, other languages, you know, like, it's something that I feel like is inherently something that I need to do. And it really freaked me out this last year to realize that with all my passion, all my go-gettingness, let's make up some words in English, shall we? Why not? It's not my language that I realized that I could have been doing more damage than good. Because here I am inserting a way of thinking into a language that doesn't even have these concepts. But being, you know, like, oh, but I want to be able to say I love my shoes. So it probably didn't, what happened? Did I push the button? Wow, when you hit this, something happens. Where's the... Okay, so um, I also have ADD, ADHD, so that tells you anything. So, so in all my go-getting-ness, um, I became very concerned about, my, um, about how I should proceed because I, was, because I realized that I was pushing concepts that maybe shouldn't even be in our languages. My, you know, in, in my language in particular, because I can't speak for any other languages at this point. Um, and so I just kind of stopped teaching for a while um, since, you know, since discovering this, to just really get in, get in deep and, and find out, you know, like, what are these other concepts? Because there's concepts I'm realizing now, and imagine that, like, I've been in the language revitalization world as an occupation since 2007. And to come to, and it has never, I've been around fluent speakers, I, you know, like, and it has never come across my lap, I don't understand that cliche, um, that there's a worldview that exists in languages, like in the Salish language. There's concepts, there's a worldview, 
that is unlike one that develops from the English language. It's, un, it's unparalleled. And that just blew my mind. And so, and so now to think about, you know, like what kind of worldview, just on the concept alone of ownership, you know, this is, this is the one that I, that I was really thinking about, is just on the concept of ownership, of what my consciousness would have looked like without that concept. My niece, to raise her without the idea, without the idea of ownership, without the concept of ownership. You know, what, what would that worldview look like? But just that one concept. You know, how, how would I view myself? How would I view you? What kind of relationship would I have with you if we, if we didn't worry so much about ownership? This idea of, of having a relationship with the land, with water, just blew my mind. You know, at the same time, you know, becoming an activist and realizing, you know, how important the water is and how disconnected we've become with, with the land, with the earth, with, with nature, with, with being able to walk outside and, and not stay clean. Because now it makes sense, you know, because I'm like, how, you know, like when we ask ourselves, how can these people do this? How can they pump in chemicals into the, into the earth and, and feel like that's okay? Well, because the concept of ownership in this English language, where we feel like we can stake claim to everything. Remember that chair? And if you, you know, as, as you guys go along, you know, tomorrow or even this evening, and if you guys look at how many times that you guys say my this and, and yours, mine and yours, is that your, where's your phone? Where's my phone? You know? Things like, and and because I was doing it myself, and I'm like trying to decolonize even the way I talk English, and then I've started to say, "Where is that phone that I use? <laughs> yeah, where are those shoes that I wear?" So and so something else really really happened, um, which was really amazing and, and and such a blessing for me, is something else got added to this is I realize that our language, our languages, um, my lang and I'll just speak for my language alone. Um, hey, just see how I said, my language? It happens all over the place. So with the language that was given to, to my ancestors way back when, when, when the ancestors were put on this earth, there was like, this, the essence was embedded into the language on how to have all these things happen, of, for it to teach us how to view the world, how to have a connection relationship with the land, how to have a connection relationship with you. It, it, it taught us that. It was, it was embedded within the language. And so now it makes sense with, you know, like for, for me to not, you know, for, for there not to be a concept of ownership. It helps me have a relationship with the land because now I know that you can't own anything. You know, so this little girl, right, wait, spiritual deity. So also within this language, it tells us about how to have a relationship. And, and so, you know, we say creator, and, and I'm still trying to come up with the concept of, of what that, spiritual, that spirituality is. Um, it's part of another um, research that I want to get into. It tells us how to have a relationship in that spiritual way. And to me, that's probably been one of the most given blessings from this whole experience of learning how to have a spiritual connection because my language is teaching me how to do that. So, now, this little girl. So just to imagine how different this experience would have been without the concept of ownership and the language that was spoken. Because from this, from this day, you know, like on this day, like I, I went back to work and I went to my teacher, my language teacher, and I, and I said, you know, hey, Supi, you know, how do you say, um, you know, I told her about the story and about how Sarah Joan found the bug. And so I started to like ask her for, for language on how to say, um, you know, did you find a bug? Is that your bug? In the language, I was doing these things. And, and, and so something interesting happened, um, and, and I think 
with the language revitalization um, effort is that there was a time when we started to revitalize our language. It started, I think it started around like 40 years ago um, with our efforts. And so that first wave of, of teachers, man, they were, I, I heard, I, I've heard stories about them, about, about our, our elders who would, if you didn't say it right, boy, they would just bang their cane down, you know, and they would say, no, say it like this. And they would just push you until you said it right. And they, they wouldn't let any kind of concepts in. But then, but then I think the next generation seeing this happening with the, with the, and with the learners, because then the learners kind of got scared, you know, a little put off, like, eh, it's really scary. They put me on the spot. They yell at me. And so the learners kind of started dropping away. So then the next wave of generation and the next wave of, like, of learners that wanted to learn the language, it seemed like it started to get lo looser. Because, it, because I think the elders maybe wanted to encourage learning no matter what. So by the time here I am, you know, like right out the gate, you know, I want to help save my language, although this has been a part of me since I was 12, since I first um, decided to, um, when I first heard the language um, in an instructional setting, <clears throat> it just, it, I just fell in love with it. And so when I got into an occupation of, of where I could actually learn and spend time with the fluent speaker, so I would run to her and I was asking her all these things. You know, how do you, how do you say um, my bug? How do you say your bug? How do you, you know, like ask the question, da 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 da. And, and, and I think she, she, you know, she would kind of be like, ah, like that, you know, but then she'd give me the answer with that idea of, you know, the ka or in the in, um, in and on of that mine yours and just started to sneak in there. So now back to this little girl. So, so imagine, imagine the concepts, you know, that she would have had given that day. And, and, I've, and I've imagined this, I've imagined this, you know, like really in depth about that day that, you know, that she went out there. She went outside and it became a spiritual experience for her to find that bug could have told her something about herself. Finding that bug, because I mean, there's something, there's something amazing about what's happening here. You know, and I just kind of brush it off because of how I view things. You know, and it comes down to my assimilation and my colonized thinking. But now looking at this through, you know, like trying to decolonize and to see this as, this isn't just a cute little picture of a girl looking at a bug. You know, this, this picture could be about, you know, like I could have said things to her like in the language of like, what is that bug saying to you? What are you saying to that bug? What is that bug teaching you? What can you teach that bug? And that relationship begins to change now. And would she have really wanted to, you know, like not having the concept of ownership and that she, stuck, she can stake claim to anything. And that rather this becomes, becomes a, a relationship, a, a connection relationship. Not one of an ownership. That she, would she have really wanted to put it in that cup and take it inside and keep it forever? Because we all know it would have died. And, it, you know, I don't, and, and, and who knows what that would have thought, but I don't think that if she was raised with that worldview of realizing that we have a connection to everything, especially nature, of how different this day would have been. And even the language that I was talking to her with and the concepts. So, and, and so this goes into, you know, like the relationship that I, that I now have, you know, cause I, this, this whole year I've been starting to really realize the importance of land and trying to instill that onto my niece now of taking her to water, to taking her to the land and having these different conversations with her, you know, about not throwing away food, you know, and things like, things like that of, 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 of describing that relationship and taking out the ownership word. And so now, you know, since, since, you know, since that time, I've really started to look at how ownership is used um, another big one, um, you know, um, the, the two that I'm, that I'm also working on is, 
is uh, the concept of love. So interesting. Because what I'm finding is that we don't have a word for love either. That, well, there's one, but it's being manipulated in a way, you know, where, these, where they're allowing this change to come in. Um, and we also don't have, like, this word thank you, it was invented. And so it's kind of funny because, you know, somebody, I remember somebody saying, boy, we were really rude in our languages. You know, again, that world view that, in, you know, in English and a lot of the European languages have this politeness thing that happens. And, you know, and so that concept of politeness maybe just didn't, need, you know, we didn't have, to, we didn't need it. You know, this excuse me doesn't exist. In my language, I'm only speaking from my language. But he comes from my people, so, because I'm Salish <laughs> proper. <laughs> just kidding. Sorry, inside joke. He's, okay, so. So this is where I, where I really saw the impact of um, just, and skimming just right off the top of these, of these concepts that have inched their way into language teaching and language speaking, like the concept of, of I love you. The elders that I talk to, they, they're hearing it and perhaps some of them saying it now. You would never have heard that. Like that, that concept wasn't given. So it's interesting because I was thinking, well, but we, you know, like, so then how did, how did people know we loved them? You know, again, my colonized way of thinking. Well, then it kind of makes sense, right? Where it's like, well, maybe it was shown. You know, maybe you didn't have to have a word because that was too easy. It was too easy just to say a word or sorry. We don't have the word sorry. What? I know, it's shocking. You know, we're such rude people. No, I was kidding. That's colonized thinking. So, so and, 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 and those kind of things are, are starting to really come in because it's like, it's like we're trying to teach our kids all these things, that, you know, like these values and things like that. So that's where I've really started to see the impacts of these concepts coming in, sneaking their way. And so, you know, it's just something to get curious about. Um, I don't know if I've sounded like I was judging it or not, but I just kind of, you know, was like hoping that that gets in your, um, you know, that comes off of your, off your tongue and out of your mouth or in, into your head to, to, to think about this, about like what concepts that are in English are pushing their way into indigenous languages that perhaps, you know, what kind of impact is that gonna have, you know, on these indigenous languages? And there was also something as I was doing my research around um, and asking these questions about ownership and about love and, you know, these, these things that I'm like, wait a minute, so you're telling me that thank you didn't exist? Like our word lemlumsh didn't exist before this certain amount of time? I'm like, that's interesting, you know? Um, and somebody said, well, well, April, somebody who got very frustrated with me, not this guy. Um, and they said, they said, but April, all languages evolve. I think we've all heard that from you know, time to time. And yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's great. You know, that, that, that they do, they do in fact, they do evolve. But the thing is, is that when our languages evolve, they need to evolve from our own set of rules. And so that's how they naturally happen. When languages evolve naturally, they're from within the language's own set of rules. So like, you know, let's say a group of people decide to drop, you know, a certain ending or a certain sound, um, you know, or they invent a language or a word. It's, it, they are doing it within their, the, the rules of their language. It becomes, I think, problematic when external outside pressures, like me running up to my fluent speaker and saying, you know, hey, you know, my niece found a bug and she was, you know, she was saying this is my bug and I want to be able to say back to her, oh, is that your bug? You know, and then, you know, so then my fluent speaker sees me so excited and that she, you know, she tells me, she's like, oh, you know, that's an, ex that's an example of ex outside external pressures. Or when I go to her and I say, I want to be able to say, I love you. You know, you're my mentor. You know, how can, how can we do that? You know, so she takes this word and that word and that word and it becomes yep and queen chamench. That's again because of external outside pressures. I didn't ask her, hey, how did we show um, you know, affection? Or how did, we, how, how, how did that concept exist? 
And so she felt that external outside pressure, and then hence the phrase was adopted. So talking to this fluent speaker, um, one of my favorite fluent speakers, love her. She was the one that got frustrated with me, and she said, April, I'm going to tell you something. She didn't, you know, this was, it, was, it was frustrating her to be like, because I was like, yeah, but like, what, if, what if these concepts aren't supposed to be in our languages? And she's like, April, I'm just going to tell you something. She's like, I was told this a long time ago, and she's like, there's a saying that either you adapt or you die. And I was like, interesting. As I walked away from that conversation, I was like, right. Now I understand where she's coming from. You know, because back then, these concepts had to be forced in because it was almost like a matter of survival. Like, my land, your land. If I didn't understand, because we didn't. We didn't understand the, the, this idea of ownership. That's one of the things that, that, we've, been, that we've heard that, that indigenous people didn't understand was this idea of ownership. It was, it was kind of funny to us, like, what do you mean you're going to give me this piece of paper that says I now own this land? Like, I'm still going to go gather berries over there on your land, you know? And then and we would. We would cross into someone else's land, and then we were starting to get shot at and threatened that if you went on their land, you were going to die. So that concept was forced upon us, and we had to learn and pass it down to our kids because it became a matter of survival. It became a matter of survival for all these different things because it's like, whoa, you know, these colonizers, I don't know what else to say. These, you know, these colonizers are, think we're rude if we don't say something with thank you, so we better, we better drum up something, you know, lem lem You know, that's how we say it. But it doesn't, it doesn't even mean thank you. We took a prayer word, Lempty, and we doubled it up. Lem lemsh. And now it's like, I realize it doesn't really mean much, but that word lempty does. So now this adapt or die concept, or th this phrase that was used, I, I now understand it. I'm now grateful to my ancestors, you know, like I have no, no grudge or no judgment on, on my elders that, that, that decided to do this. But now I'm starting to realize and, and come to terms with that. We, this, this concept, adapt or die, if we continue to adapt, and we've heard this, we will die. And, 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 and so as indigenous people say, if we, when we lose our languages, we die. I'm not sure if any of you have heard that, but that's a constant theme that runs through when we're talking, when, when indigenous people are talking about language revitalization, is we say, um, you know, when we lose our languages, we're going to die. And that made no sense to me in my colonized way of thinking. And now I do. Now that it, through what I've described, I hope, I hope it leaves an impression on you guys as well, that it's not going to be a physical death. It's going to be a spiritual death. It's going to be a worldview, like how I described to you, because it's already being lost on me, and it's going to take a lot of work to get it back to start to, ha take, to learn those concepts so I can now shape a worldview of how my people used to think, of how, we have to, of, of how we used to have that connection with the water, with the land, with each other, those relationships. And these relationships are so important. And of course, most of all, that, that, that connection, you know, with that, that, that being that put us on this earth, and to honor that, that connection. So I hope, I hope my talk inspired you. Just kidding. Well, and that's it. Do you like that? I just curtsied. I just curtsied. Hello, colonization. So I said, I don't know who's introducing you. Oh, whoa. That, that doesn't mean nothing. Don't, don't get panicked. I don't, this pointer is going crazy. Sorry, let me just. Thank you for listening. I really, really, really appreciated it. Um, I, as he gets ready, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. I don't need it. Oh, boy. <sighs> I would like to take this time now to introduce my good friend, my good and only friend. Just kidding, he's not. But it sounded good, right? My good friend, Selim Rivers. Um, as I said, we, we have an awesome relationship. Um, He's, he's, he's younger than me. I, added, I wanted to add the much younger and make all you guys think of how old I am. 
but he's been an inspiration to me. You know, this guy, like, like I'll Skype with him and I'll be like, I had, you know, every time I was coming across these realizations, you know, like I'd be like, hey, I just found something. I just talked to this elder today. And, and you know, he's an awesome sounding board. He's, you know, like he's in almost, he's in millions of articles. <laughs> Let's just exaggerate a little bit. <laughs> You know, and I just, I think he's honestly a really famous person. You know, we were, we were at this, the die-in the other day. And, um, you know, and, and all these Indian people were around. I was like, hey, who's that? Who's that? And he's like, I don't know. And he's like, April, I'm not that famous. Because I really do think he's famous. And, and I think the world of him, um, he's been doing this work for a really long time. He's been doing the language uh, method that we both do um, way longer than I have you know, started revitalizing his language at a very young age and, and, you know, increased his fluency. And so by the time I met him, I was like, whoa, this guy has set the bar so high. Like, I got to really start busting my bum, because we say bum in Canada. I give you. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. I give you Kasilam Rivers. <laughs> Would you want it on there? That was a pretty good introduction. Now she gets to sit and watch my presentation because he hasn't seen it at all. Go to that one. Awesome. Thank you. That was awesome. It was interesting because, I mean, we, me and her have had conversations about this, but um, some of the stuff that's coming to mind for me now, I think it was the story that really hit it for me to be able to understand um, the main points. I'm just going to move this a little bit because... There we go. So um, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to bring this night together to introduce concepts around decolonization. And I would like to talk about as well, I mean, what does decolonization mean? Um, and what does decolonization mean in the context of language revitalization? And how the strategies that we are using to revitalize our languages are furthering the colonization of our languages. I think what April highlighted very eloquently is, you know, the effect of colonizing our languages have on us, how that affects us on an individual level, but I also think about how that affects us on a societal level when I was thinking about her speech. You think about the whole concept of terra nullis, that the land is empty and that it can be staked. There's a claim that can be staked. There's an there's a ownership there. I mean, people came here and assumed that, oh, this area is not being used, so I'm going to own it. I'm going to claim it, and it's mine now. Um, and how much that has created the society that we live in, um, and how much that has created this, you know, occupied, stolen territory that we're on. Um, and it all comes from, you know, ideology, but also really even deeper than that, the concepts in which the culture has really allowed that to happen. And so we think about um, resisting, or resisting colonialism and, and decolonization. Can we make that same choice to have that um, come from the same depth that colonization came from? On a, on a personal, individual, but also deeply embedded in our behaviors and our assumptions, our co concepts, all that kind of stuff. So, oh yeah, I got the clicker too. I forgot about that. So, who are we? Like I mentioned earlier, I'm Skotmish, which is often translated, uh, the English version that it became was Squamish. And then there's also Humatquim, which is further to the south. And then Slewatooth is Slewatath or Slewit Oth. Those are in the two languages in um, Hunkamitnam. Slewit Tath in Hunkamitnam and Slewit Oth in Squamish. And so I made this map, and you can kind of see uh, the red line is Squamish territory. The yellow line, if you can see it, is Slewit Tath territory. And the green line is Humatquim territory. Um, there's also a pinkish line that goes to the top. That's uh, Statlimach, and then there's also a blue line to the west, which is Seashelt or Sheshat. So I just want to like draw your attention to where we're at. Like you can see English Bay, Broad Inlet, um, and so you know you hear Coast Salish territories. Well, what does this actually mean? Notice how all three of our territories, the lines over cross each other, right? So that's what you know Coast Salish means. The other part is that you know. Um, one of the interesting things that I've been introducing to people is, you know, learning the names of the people that come from this territory in their languages. 
you know, a lot of times people start to, there's a trend that's happened and it, it's um, happened over the last, you know, 10 years or so where people will get up and they'll, you know, they'll acquire somebody from the territory to do an opening and there has to be somebody recognized from the territory to do a blessing or some sort of thing. And it's, there's a, you know, there's a trajectory where these things type, type start to happen, where they become mainstream. I remember I was really surprised when I had like MLAs under the Liberal government with Gordon Campbell, like, we would like to thank the Squamish people for being on their territory, right? You have a colonial government acknowledging us, recognizing us, and saying that this, we're thankful to be on their territory. I mean, it's entirely meaningless in the context of stolen land and a colonial government that continues that theft and the continued theft and support of the theft of resources and, and culture from this territory, but they acknowledge us now. Oh, great. We're acknowledged. Thank you so much. That means so much to me, to be acknowledged by a colonial government. But there is a relationship that starts on a you know a community level. If you're from this territory, you start building a relationship with the community. This is a, a photo um, of um, the community that I grew up in. This is back uh, about eight just after the 1900s. And this is a traditional dugout canoe that was being carved in Aslan. And this is like the way that my people traveled around this territory for so many years. And so there's lots of place names in the territory. Um, Kam Kamalai is one of them, which is located, or would be located where, um, kind of where Gastown is now. The waterfront used to come up further, um, which means a place of maple trees. And so a lot of the place names uh, in their territory are actually places that you would be able to visibly see from the water because everybody traveled by the water. So if you're pointing your canoe somewhere, you're pointing it towards one of those places. Um, in the place that I come from, means pla place of fast rolling waters. Aslahan, where this is at, um, refers to um, touching because the word Tlaten means to touch something. And so Aslahan refers to touching. And the, the thing that I learned from my elder was that when you were approaching the community, the bay went so far inland that it was like you were going so far up close to the mountains, to like Grouse Mountain and, and uh, the sisters, that it was almost like you could touch them. So that's a concept that's, you mean that you can only see that when you come in from the water. And there's another photo of our, our people and the canoes. Um, this is in um, Coal Harbor. And the whole family traveling on those canoes. I mean, that's a really big canoe. Uh, it's one of my favorite photos because it's so beautiful. And you can see more canoes up top. They used to have uh, canoe races. And you can also see the, sh the sailing ship up on top left. And then here's Aslahan. Aslahan was a, a place that began the really effective colonization of my people. It was a place where it became the epicenter for Christianity and conversion within my community. But it was also the place where a lot of the project of colonialism, um, direct colonialism in terms of, you know, reserve systems, in terms of residential schools, in terms of conversion to Christianity really began. And it was one of the places, it was considered one of the most successful, you know, um, places for that as an experiment. And so it became uh, the mission on the inlet. And so you can see all the canoes and all the people. There's the, the church that was built. They would have gatherings there. And the whole community was built around this church. And it became so uh, controlled that it was, it was every, they were inspected. You had, your houses were inspected daily in the morning and in the evening. You had to be in bed by a certain time, everybody in the village, no matter the age. And they had policemen that would come around and inspect when you weren't home and they would actually like peek into your windows and, and, and look inside and make sure that you know, your beds were made, that your floors were washed, that your counters were washed, everything. And because it was considered, you know, we didn't have these concepts around uh, houses and, and beds and, and things. And so they thought that we were uncivilized because we didn't do these things. So they had to teach us how to clean our houses and stuff like that. And I wrote an article recently about this, and I'm going to touch on it a little bit, was that one of the things that happened in this colonization was that they came and they, the church would give gifts to individuals. And so the, we had a form of leadership that was not um, in the sense of political leadership or, you know, a leader, leader is in the sense of a political office, but leader in the sense of by a person's uh, upbringing, a person's quality as a human being, and a person's um, characteristics that people felt that they had leadership quality, and they were called a siam. 
And so there were certain individuals that, that had these characteristics. They were generous, they were knowledgeable, or they performed ceremonies within our culture, and so they were knowledgeable about ceremony. And so we families would respect them. I had one of my teachers say to me, it was like if I was to go on a canoe journey and I wanted somebody to skip the canoe for me, I would look around and ask, who's the most respected person I see here? Who do I respect most to lead us on that journey if we're heading you know, two weeks up north? And, that, and then the crew is going to pick that person and they're going to lead us. And so that's what it was kind of like. And so what the church did is they started giving gifts to these leaders to raise their status in the eyes of the church so that people would listen to them, to the church, through these leaders. And eventually they started um, kind of organizing it where in order to be recognized by the church, you had to be sober, uh, Christian, and you know, participating in the civilizing project. And so a lot of these leaders, you know, were given gifts by the church. And a lot of these um, leaders that were selected by the church became the headmen of all the reserves and the reserve system was set up. And so there was a headman for each of the reserves by the time 1901 came around. And so this whole endeavor was an effort to, again, call it, to take the people off the land, put them on the reserves, and keep them there. There was a point where if you were off the reserve for a certain period of time, you would have your Indian status removed or the police would come after you and you weren't allowed to leave. You can get licenses to leave if you're going hunting for food, but you had to be back by a certain date. And eventually these leaders that were selected as the headmen of the reserves would become the enforcers for that. There were some that still practiced the old ways and the traditional ways. Um, and there was attempts to remove them from, you know, prominence within the community. And there were splits within the community where some people from this community um, wanted to con continue practicing some of the traditional ways, and so they actually moved to Humalchistan, where, where I grew up at later. And there was more people living up in, in Squamish that were also practicing traditional ways. And so this whole thing around colonialism has shaped our identity. And I want to talk a little bit about this concept that has really impacted us, and I'm going to touch on it a little bit later. But one of the things that became really prominent in our colonization of our concepts of identity was that we became Indian bands, we became members of Indian bands, we, be, we were given Indian status, and so our identity in the context of Canada was in relation to our Indian status. I wouldn't be considered an Indian unless I had Indian status, and I wouldn't be considered Squamish unless I had Indian status. And so we became you know, members of Indian bands. And it was, this, is, this is the relationship to our community. My relationship is one in which I receive benefits. What do I receive? What does the government give me? What does my Indian band give me? I receive benefits. And then and in some ways, how do I exercise my rights as a band member? Right? I can vote, I can, I can participate in band meetings. I have certain ways of accessing those benefits. That's the relationship. That's my relationship to the community, at least in a colonized concept. And we, I came across this concept and this kind of um, idea. I was doing some work in my community around uh, membership uh, in my community uh, last year. And I noticed that there was a question in my mind that I had around how do, did our ancestors see themselves as a part of the community in relation to everybody else? How do they see themselves? Did, did involvement in the community require participation and you know, generosity being given back. Could I just sit in the community as a community member 500 years ago and just receive everything from everyone? Expect people to build my house, expect people to feed me, expect people to go get the fish and do everything and I could just sit there. What would happen if I were just to sit there and not do anything and not give anything back to anybody? When in our, con in our communities today, it is very constantly um, a question of, you know, community members, when's the band going to do this for me? When are they going to fix my window? When are they going to do this? When are they going to do that? Because our concept of identity has been shaped by this. It's not shaped by a more indigenous concept of identity. And so that's what part of what decolonization has been about for me, figuring out what are those indigenous concepts that we have and how do we bring them back so that they're relevant and present in our lives and our community. So what is colonization and what is decolonization? Colonization at a fundamental level, in a simple way, means it was an attempt to change the people from being you know, something that understood community, that understood what it meant to be healthy, 
and understood what it meant to have a relationship to each other and to the land. And changing that into one in which we didn't have those things, where we didn't understand our relationship to the land, where we didn't understand our relationship to each other, and we didn't have healthy communities anymore. That's kind of the, ba the, the simple part of what colonization has done. And so when I try to explain decolonization to people, people ask me, well, isn't that really indigenization? Are we supposed to become indigenous? I also often hear from um, many well-meaning white liberal people that, you know, we're all indigenous. We're all indigenous, which has a really nice way of erasing uh, colonization and the history of colonization in North America. But one of the things that I started to introduce in my mind and what I started to stumble upon as I was learning about you know, indigenous cultures and my people's ways was around what happens when a forest is decimated, either by forest fire or logging or some other sort of natural disaster. And so that's where I came across this con you know, the, I, the concept of ecological succession. And so I created this poster, which I can't really read because it's small on here, and I think I can read it on here. So regeneration and removal is the invitation of decolonization. When a fire burns a forest down, a process begins to reclaim and reoccupy the space. Invasive plant species can corrupt the process. Ecological succession is the process of change in the structure of an ecological community over time. The community begins to with a few trailblazing plants and animals and grows through increasing complexity until it becomes a stable or self-perpetuating as a climax community. Ecological succession is our decolonial progression. A complex succession of tree species from one stage to the next of various ages, size, forms, the climax community. Complex life full of spiritual possibility, wisdom, and abundance is alive in this community. This process of change will be long, but each step along the way leads somewhere. The decolonization invitation is an intergenerational work to remove the invasive colonialism and renew the indigenous community. Through recovery, we will again feel indigenous pathways of action and freedom. What are our pathways to continue the succession of renewal to be a community of abundance once again? And so uh, the way I explain it is that decolonization is both a, a work of you know, removal, but also the work of regenerating. It involves regenerating these ways in which I said, you know, we have connection to each other and our, our people and our community. We have a community. Understand what it means to have healthy relationships. Understand what it means to have a healthy relationship to our land and to the water. That's part of it, bringing that back, regenerating that. But when we're trying to do that, just in the same way that when a forest is trying to come back, if you're dealing with invasive plant species like Himalayan blackberry and and many, um, the vines that grow up trees, you know, that's going to choke that process out. It's going to prevent that process from happening, or it's going to make it really difficult. And so as we're trying to regenerate our communities and our society and decolonize, but we have ways in which that is being prevented, the work is twofold. It's, it's, it, there's two ways about it. We're both trying to regenerate, and we're both trying to remove. So I don't know if anybody have ever been in a forest. Many people think of like, you know, Stanley Park as an old growth forest when in actually, actuality it's been logged many times. Um, and most of the trees there are about a, hundred, you know, a few hundred years old. There's some older ones, but it's been logged many times. This whole area around here was a forest at one point where you had, you know, 1500 year old trees. And if anybody gets a chance to go to an old growth forest, I highly recommend it because just walk in an old growth forest and feel what the air feels like, feel what the ground feels like. And just imagine whenever you're an old growth forest that this is what downtown Vancouver looked like, that there were trees this tall. And so there's a process where, you know, a forest fire gets a forest gets destroyed through a forest fire, and then first thing that come back are like things like the flowers, and then you get perennial plants and grasses and weeds. Then you get the little shrubs and little um, plants, um, berry bushes and things like that. And then the softwoods, trees. And then in, around here, you might get like cottonwoods, and the alders, and eventually the cedars and the maples. And then it starts growing into the other trees. And then eventually you get like a big giant forest where the canopy is up really high, but down below it's, there isn't that many little bushes anymore. It's actually, you can see most of the, the forest floor. And what happens is that the, the climax community in a forest, it just starts you know, regenerating. It just starts cycling through it. It's reached a climax point where everything is just coming back. Everything is there, and then if something dies, it just comes back again. There's no next stage to it. It's just perpetuating. And so that's the work that we're trying to do, get to that point. But the thing that I realized is that the work that I'm doing 
is only one stage in that. And the work that to do decolonization is not something that I'm going to accomplish in my lifetime, but is something that at which I can contribute to the next generation the same way that the people that came before me contributed to me being here to be able to do this. It contributed to the way in which I was able to learn the language because somebody made a sacrifice for me to do this. Somebody in my people's history did that. And so there is a way in which, you know, you think about seven generations, how can my decisions affect the next seven generations? But also, how can the work that I do affect the next seven generations? What can I do to set them up? I even think about that in the context of social movements, in the context of the social justice movement. I was thinking about this in the context of Idle No More when I was participating this past winter. What would I be able to do to set up the next uprising so that they have the tools or the knowledge or the, the perspective or the worldview that's going to make their work even more successful than we could ever achieve? What could I do? And I mean, that's a very long-term thinking, but there is something um, in the long-term thinking that I think comes from indigenous cultures and it comes from our, our way of thinking about how to build community. I've jumped a couple places. I'm, just, I'm gonna next show you a picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a picture of my grandmother and my auntie. Um, I'm gonna share a little bit of a story about my how I came to where I'm at now. So I, I was raised by my grandmother from when I was about one till I was six. My grandmother went to residential school for ten years. Her parents um, also were devout ca uh, Catholic and Christian, but my great grandfather was a known. Um, fighter for an indigenous rights and Aboriginal rights, and he actually became he didn't officially become a lawyer because at the time, in order to be to join the bar, you'd have to enfranchise and, and relinquish your uh, in, in, uh, stat Indian status. So he became knowledgeable as a lawyer um, and trained as a lawyer, but he didn't actually become a official lawyer. But he did also defend people and um, become be, act as a lawyer for many people over his many years of work, and so. He was um, threatened by the RCMP that if my grandmother didn't go to residential school, they would arrest him or his wife, my great-grandmother. So she went to residential school for 10 years. She was the third oldest out of uh, many children. And so she, she was, um, had a very traumatic experience in residential school around language. She spoke it before she went, but by the time she had left, she had um, lost a lot of it. And she would spend uh, 10 months out of the year living there. She would only go home for the summers. And I'm talking like you're, she lives 500 meters away from her parents' place. And she couldn't see them or couldn't see her grandparents uh, because she was in residential school. But for, for everything that she went through, my, I, I give so, so much amazing credit to my grandmother. Her name, ancestral name is Tealtalope because when I lived with her, she did something with me, which was that I wasn't allowed to watch cartoons or play outside or go do anything after school unless I listened to a half hour of tapes that had Squamish language, um, Squamish language on it and traditional singing on it. Every day I had to do this, from when I was about one till I was about six when I moved with my dad. And my grandmother always took me to cultural events as my people were starting to revitalize our traditional canoeing and our culture and our songs and stuff like that. And so I grew up in this kind of, my grandmother didn't speak the language, but she felt that it was important and she wanted me to speak it. She knew that she couldn't teach me, teach me herself because she didn't know it, but she wanted me to feel, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, pride in my culture, pride in my identity and pride in my language that this, that these things would be important to me. And so that's how I was able to grow up feeling that language is important because of my grandmother. And I owe her a lot of credit for that. And I like it when I talked about, you know, ecological succession and decolonization, my grandmother has paved a lot of way for me to do that. Same with my parents and my, and my aunties and uncles. So as I started learning about um, the language, I came across this method called Wary Keys a few years ago um, with one of mine and April's mutual friend, Evan. Evan Gardner is from Oregon, and he was one of the founders of uh, Wary Keys. And Wary Keys was uh, a method that got introduced to me as a way to become fluent in a language. It had never before, you know, concepts around fluency had been introduced to me before. I remember somebody saying, oh, it'd take you 30 years to become fluent. And, it would, you know, fluency means that you can have dreams in your language and that you can, you can um, 
be creative in your language and things like that. And I was like, oh, wow. I mean, I'd love to become fluent, but it seems like such an untangible possibility. It was never something that I could do. Until I met him and he introduced where he keys to me and said, no, we create fluency within a couple of years using this method. And I was like, wow, I can become fluent in my language in a couple of years. Um, and so I started working with him, um, trained in where he keys, started learning my language. And then I had the opportunity of doing a master apprentice um, program with an elder from my community where I spent um, a certain amount of time a week where we would just do immersion in the language and would just stay in the language. And I remember the first time that I ever started um, learning about the culture in the language from my language teacher. I also remember the first time I ever started asking her about the language, meaning like grammar and syntax and these things and suffixes and prefixes and all that stuff in the language, where I was asking her, okay, if I say this before this, would that still be correct? And she's like, well, actually, it would be good if you said it this way. We're just talking in the language. And I remember the first time I did that. And I remember that was the day that I realized that I was onto something and that I was actually, I could become fluent in my language and it wouldn't take me that long. And so I've been working with, with revitalizing Squamish, my language, for the past few years. But the reason that I'm revitalizing my language is not because of the language. It's not because the language would it'd be really neat to be able to speak the language. That's part of it. But what's really different as I started learning the language was how much my worldview was changing. How much my way of thinking was changing because I was thinking more like my ancestors. And most recent studies show that even, you know, you change the words that you use in English, even in English, you'll have a very different physical reaction to it, right? You use positive reinforcement or you use terms that, f that are empowering, you will have a different physical reaction to it. Even in English, right? You talk about positive ways, you give yourself positive affirmations, you will physically feel different. And this happens even with an indigenous community where, you know, if I call myself, if I say I'm from a nation, not from an Indian band, well, what is a nation? How is a nation different from an Indian band? Well, a nation has laws, it has governance, it has, it has a country, or it has its own um, culture, its own language, right? That's very different than an Indian band. You know, I talk about myself as being a citizen, not a member. How is a citizen different than a member? I have a membership to the gym. Is that the same relationship I have to my community? That I pay a fee and then I get, you know, certain benefits of the month and I can access these classes? Is that who I am as a, as a Scopemish person? And then you talk about things like Indian versus Indigenous. What is an Indian? What is an Indigenous? Differences there. And then, you know, I talk about myself being Canadian or I talk about myself being Scopemish. So even these concepts will start to have a different physical reaction for, for myself. When I identify as you know, an indigenous person who is Skotmish and a citizen of my nation, that's all, just some of that's just in English. It changes even more when you start getting into the language. And so right now I wanna demonstrate that for you and I'm gonna ask April to come up. And I'm gonna do a little demonstration to demonstrate what that actually looks like and what that feels like. And some people here might know what I'm doing. Um, so I'm going to ask you, um, I want you to say to yourself out loud some of the, the tapes that you have around language, some of the things that you tell yourself when you're um, experiencing challenges or when things aren't working for you, what are the things that you tell yourself, those negative tapes that you tell yourself, okay? In English. In English. Okay? And I want you to put your, your arm out like this, straight and up. And when you start, when I tell you to go, I'm going to be pushing your arm down, okay. and I want you to resist me and keep your arm up, okay? okay? So you can tell me, you know, things like, I'm stupid, I'm not good enough, you know, that, that kind of stuff, okay? okay. You, don't we, you don't have to help me. Uh, sorry, sorry, yeah. okay. Okay, so arm straight, I'm going to start pushing down. Ready, go. You can say I'm out loud. You can say them out loud. Oh, I'm wasting my time. I should get a real job so I could pay my bills. Um, I'm not smart enough to do this. Resist. I'm trying. <laughs> oh, and I work out. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. okay, cool. Now shake it out. Shake it out. Shake it out. Now, I want you to, to give yourself positive affirmations. Tell yourself the things that are true about yourself, but the things that you also um, 
the things that you tell yourself to encourage you and the, the, the contracts that you make with yourself. The opposite of your tapes, okay? okay. And put your arm up, and I'm going to do the same. And I'm, I'm going to push down, and I want you to do that this time, okay? And go. Out yeah. Okay. Um, I am smart enough to do this. I'm not wasting my time. This is probably the most important thing I should ever be doing in my life. This makes me happy. Um, I'm doing this for the kids. I'm really pushing on my arm. Keep going. Um, you can say say them again if you need okay, to. I'm I am smart enough. Um, this is definitely. <laughs> <laughs> what <happened>? Okay. <laughs> okay. Good. Yeah, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, was a round of applause for April. <laughs> so, did you notice the second time that she kept her arm up? I was actually pu I was pushing on her heart arm harder the second time. So when she told herself positive things about herself, changed her language, her body had a physical reaction. She f her body physically did something different. Even then she was just using English. She was telling herself in English and her body still had it. And you know, that's the, co the connection between you know, our mind and our body, right? Now the thing that I started to realize as I was decolonizing and decolonizing my mind was when I start saying things to myself in my language, I feel different. When I start expressing myself in my language, I feel different. It's almost like I can feel, sometimes I feel like I have, you know, I have thousands of people standing behind me ready to push me on and support me when I'm speaking my language. That's a very different physical, your body will feel very physically different when you feel like that. But even more than that is that when I start um, saying concepts in my mind that come from my language around things like family and things like community, I feel very different. Then if I, even if I use things like nation and citizen, governance, all that kind of stuff, I will physically feel different. So if I physically feel different, I'm going to behave differently. I'm going to treat people differently. I'm going to act differently. And I'm also going to come up with different ideas and concepts because of how that is all affecting me. And, and April demonstrated very, I think, very well how much that is the importance of our languages because if our languages become decolonized, then we're going to be losing out on that because we're just going to be speaking English, but with Squamish words. I had a friend that said to me, the, the goal of language revitalization isn't so that our children in 100 years can go to downtown Vancouver and order a Big Mac in Squamish. Like, that's not our goal. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to revitalize our language so that our young people in 100 years will be able to understand a way of viewing the world that is so different than the one that we grew up with as English as first language speakers. That, they, that there is only one perspective, there's only the, the Squamish perspective on the world, this is the only place for that. There's nowhere else in the world that they speak Squamish. There's nowhere else in the world that this culture has come from this territory that has this to offer to the world. This is the only place. So it's not like we want people to be able to order a Big Mac in the language or, or build a computer in the language. It's that we want them to understand a worldview, a way of understanding the world, a way of understanding each other, the community that's so different than everywhere else. This is a, a map of my territory, a uh, corner of it. And over here, um, just on the left, is that we have a village called Chiquet. And that's where um, one of my one of our stories about where my people originated. We have a story of a great flood, and that's one of the villages that we originated on. And then just across from there, we have an island. Um, in English, it's called Shelter Island. And I did a, a little. I'll show you a little story with you. I did an archaeological survey on the west half of the island, so the part that's sticking out. And we were doing this archaeological survey, and we had to go inspect all the little beaches. There was about twelve of them. These tiny little beaches, probably like some of them aren't even the length of, of the stage. They're just really small. And we had to go down and climb down and walk down and look at the beach and see if there's any artifacts and any um, evidence of uh, human use or technology. And what was really interesting is that as we started going to every beach, we started finding archaeological sites on every single beach. And we got to the point, and it was really cool. We seen uh, we went out to the point to have lunch, and we seen that we're on, there's these two big rocks. So there would be like a big outcropping here and a big outcropping there, and the water came in this way, this way, and that way. 
And then as we we're sitting on one of the outcroppings, I was looking around and the other guy I was working with, his archaeologist, was looking around and we seen that there was a pile of rocks going up this way and a pile of rocks uh, along here and a pile of rocks along here and then another pile over on that side. And so what we realized was actually there was a fish trap there and that they would put up um, stakes in the ground in the rocks and then they would have nets and then they would open the nets and the tide would come in and all the fish would swim in and then the, you close the net and then you wait for the tide to go out and all of a sudden it's full of, full of food. But what we realized as we're noticing that the whole island had archaeological sites was that there must have been tons of people to be able to use that much territory around that area. You think about harvest season, how many people would be coming to the area to harvest, either fish or, or, or game or berries. And so we start thinking about the concepts, um, our, our longhouses. This is a blueprint that I made of a traditional uh, Coast Salish longhouse. And so this one is, um, there's 12 foot sections, so there's 48 feet long, it's 11 feet high, and then 26 feet wide. This is what a traditional longhouse looked like. It was slanted one side. And you can fit, you know, you think, we start thinking about how many families could you fit in a longhouse, and then over a region, how many families could you fit in the area? And you think about, okay, now we're talking thousands of people living in the village that was just in that one area. And that when the harvest season came, everybody would just spread out would spread out because it was time to eat and he needed to survive. And so every beach was being occupied. And so here's uh, one side view of what a longhouse looked like. Here's the top view. And then here's a little 3D thing I did. So, you, you know, there's sections. And so each section we blocked off and a family would live in each section. Each family might have a little fire so they could cook their food. And then when big gatherings happened, he would clear everything out so it would be one big area and everybody could come in and sit and he would do ceremonies in here. And so each family was living in a longhouse. So if you have a, an area, it just times how many longhouses you can fit in the area. The other part of it is that you could keep adding on to the, to the longhouse. Right? Here's uh, one with four sections. You just keep adding on another six section, fifth, 12 section, 11 section. There was a longhouse that was in um, Huai Hui in our village at, in Lumberman's Arch that was measured at... Uh, 900 feet long and 300 feet wide. And so there was 11 families living in it. I don't know how many square feet that is, but that's a pretty big longhouse. And I jumped back and forth through two places, so I'm just trying to catch up where I'm at right now. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, the reason I brought this up was that one of the, the things that we started, I started to realize was, you know, you think about how organized our people would have been to organize all the food for that. If you had thousands of people living in their territory. I mean, there's so many things that we have for granted now, of course, in the society in terms of just food. Where do we get our food and how do we get our food? Who gets our food for us? Whereas we 400, 200, 300 years ago, how much organization would it take for thousands of people to, to do that? Or what it would be like to grow up in a house where you had no rooms. How many people here have like brothers and sisters that they grew up with? How long do you think you would survive if none of you had your own room <laughs> and that there was no walls separating you? Yeah. And think about how much you think about this is my room, this is my space, this is, you know, my rules apply here. You have to knock on the door before you come in, all that kind of stuff. Now imagine how you would have, you just, survival instincts, in order to get to get along, what you would have to do and accept to be able to live in a house where everything's open. There was, um, you know, they would put border, um, dividers up on each section in between some of the families. So you'd have a little, you know, a mat basically that was made out of, a, out of bulrush or it might be made out of wool or cedar. So there'd be a mat, but it's thin. This is our, that's the other thing is that, you know, you're living on that side of the mat, I'm living on this side of the mat. If you do something on your side of the mat that pisses me off, I mean, it doesn't take me much to be able to go like that and to invade your space. I can just, you know, come in, bulldoze down and start kicking. You're going to be really disrespectful, you're going to be upset, um, we'll have a problem, but I mean, physically I could do that. I could easily just push it over. There's a, a concept that there is a thin... Um, a thin mat between us. Now we talk about concepts um, between indigenous communities and non-indigenous communities that applies. There is very, there's so many things where all 
uh, settler society would have to do is push over the mat, and they're invading indigenous space. It's so easy, and that, I mean that's part of the, the the concept of privilege and the privilege that settlers have within a colonized country. That there is so much that settler uh, a settler um, privilege can do to push over the mat, and there's so much that indigenous societies can't do to push over that, even if we tried to. It takes so much work to be able to do that <laughs> back. <laughs> so there's a thin veil between us. And so you understand what it would be like to grow up in a society where you didn't have those concepts of, you know, this is my room, this is your room, this is what we do here. And you think about what type of language you would need or what you would have if you grew up that way. And then what, happen, what happens to the language when it changes as we start growing, living in modern homes with modern rooms where each individual nuclear family is living together and the extended family is being split up. I'm no long, longer living with my first cousins and my second cousins. It's all changing. And so we become colonized. And of course, our concepts become colonized. We don't know how to live together anymore. And we don't know how to organize anymore. Wow. Um, so one of the things with revitalizing languages is that there's different strategies that have been employed to revitalize languages. One of them is linguistics. And so linguistics is the scientific study of human language. You know, you've got language form, so how it works, and language, the meaning of the language, and the language context is kind of broken down into those three categories. So it's linguistics. But the thing about linguistics is that linguistics is not the study, the scientific study, of rebuilding language fluency. Fluency is what language revitalization means in practical terms. If I'm going to talk about what it means to become a fluent, uh, to revitalize my language, let's think, let's think about what that actually looks like. that there is a community of speakers, that it's intergenerational, and that there is communication happening, there's expression happening, there's cultural happening. There is a community of fluent speakers, and linguistics is not that. So when we're talking about language, there's you know linguistics way of approaching it. There is the reading and orthographical, so I can you know write things up on the board and get you to repeat after me. Um, and then there's the way of teaching that's become really pro prevalent um, for indigenous languages is that we teach the language the same way you know you learn French or Spanish in the high school. We just basically take their materials, translate it, and then teach it the same way. So if anybody's ever taken um, language classes, you know you might learn things like body parts and counting and numbers and stuff like that. But you never learn how to speak the language in, in terms of having a conversation with somebody. You never learn how to be able to fluently engage in a conversation, even a, de a debate or, or a conversation where you have different viewpoints. You never learn how to be able to master the language so much that you can tease people in the language or, or joke in the language. So it, I don't know, when I was going to school, I don't think anybody that I knew that went through the compulsory um, school schooling system that took you know, a second language, mostly it was French, ever came out fluent from it. I don't know if it happens that often. But for some reason, we started appropriating the same way of teaching those languages and did it with Squamish. And, did, and we do it with many languages. The other way is immersion. That you immerse yourself in the language so that you become, you, you become surrounded by the language. One of the things about revitalizing our languages is that you know, they expect that in the next 25 years, 700 or 800 of the world's indigenous languages are going to go extinct. That's like a language every two weeks. My language has maybe five fluent speakers. Uh, Hunkamitnam, which I'm working with, has one. Seashell, which is to the north, has two. Those are the three most endangered languages in BC, and they're all in this, ter this area. And so that context means, you know, if I want to learn Spanish, I can go to Mexico and become immersed in it, and I'd probably pick it up within a year because I'm surrounded by it and I learned to survive in it. And I can, you know, if I'm really trying hard at it, there's a place that I can go where the language is going to exist, where I'm going to be surrounded by it. But there is no, there is no Mexico for the Squamish language. There is no place that I can go and just be in the language because it, 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 we have four fluent speakers, five fluent speakers left. One of the other things is that you know when you're learning language. Um, we tend to learn language through a process that involves, you know, first we hear it, then we understand it, then we speak it, then we use it, we read it, then we write it, then explain it. 
But you think about language learning, how it often happens is languages will teach you first to, you know, will explain it, will tell you what, how, what this word is and what it, what it means. Then we'll write it out for you, put it on the board, and we'll put it use a fancy phonetic or uh, orthographics writing system that has sevens and x's with underlines and u's with little marks above it. Um, then we'll read it out to you and get you to use it. You have to okay. I'm going to write it up to you on the board. I'm going to write you know, um, Chawai on the board, and then get you to repeat it after me many times. And you have to read it, and then you're using it, and then we we'll get you to speak it. And eventually, you, under, you might understand it, and then you actually hear the word. You know, somebody else says that you know what they mean. So that's the way that a lot of language programs actually design their, their, their attempt to revitalize languages. But we know that's not how children learn languages. As no, uh, we know that's not how we learn languages. When we were learning to speak English, we, or, if, or whatever our first language is, first we heard it, then we started associating it to understand it with something, then we started speaking it. That's why children won't speak out their first language for months. Then we started using it, and then eventually we started to learn to read and write it. And then we learn to explain it. We can explain the language, explain what it means. You know how many people can explain the definition of words? Sometimes we, you know, there's some words that we just don't know that we, we okay, we, I know how to use it. I know when it's used, I know what it means, but I can't really explain it. It would make sense that if we talk about talking concepts in terms that come from indigenous cultures, it too would affect our behaviors, our beliefs, and our actions. Perhaps we would be more inclined to collaborate and organize the way their ancestors did by learning this, these languages, and revitalizing these languages. And so, one of the, the concepts that I really believe in is you know, immersion to create fluency, and to create a community of language speakers. Um, there's a technique that I'd like to share with you all that I use from uh, revitalizing languages. And so I'm going to put this back up here. And I'm going to get everybody to, to go through this uh, technique that I use with everybody. So first of all, I'm going to get everybody to um, take everything out of your hands and go like this. I'm just kidding. Wake you up. <laughs> Um, I've, I've done this with a few people before. I know there's some people. Well, there we go. I know there's some people that have um, seen this before, so you can help help me help people with it. So first thing, I want everybody to go like this. Okay. One of the things I do when I teach language is I teach um, hand signs with the language because it's a physical uh, kinesthetic learning style. So we add body movement to language learning. So I want everybody to go like this, and this is a technique. Everybody say technique. Copycat. Okay, so this is the first technique. Whenever I do this, I, that means I want you to copycat what I'm doing and what I'm saying. Okay, so technique, copycat. Cool. Uh, the first technique I want everybody to learn is technique, obviously. Okay, you have to put um, energy into that, like you're a nine-year-old little girl. <laughs> okay, so technique, obviously. Right, I, I got to get more, um, more energy in that. Okay, technique. Obviously, there you go, cool. So one of the things is that we're, when we learn language, we want to make things obvious. We want to make it as obvious as possible. So I'm going to be doing some things that are very obvious, obviously. So the next technique is technique travels with Charlie. Does everybody copycat that? Say travels with Charlie. So travels with Charlie is a roadmap to fluency. This is how we, how we map out becoming fluent in a language. It's one way. It's useful right now until something more useful comes along than great, but it's one of the ways that we use it. And it's a tool that we found very useful. So first thing, Charles of Charlie, everybody point here. This is Tarzan. Right, everybody say Tarzan. Tarzan can only say really simple things. Like, I am Tarzan, and you are Jane, and rock, and stick, and pen, and monkey, banana, right? Tarzan can say lists of words and maybe phrases. That's it. That's all Tarzan can do. Okay? So everybody got to Tarzan. And then we have getting to the party. What questions would you need to ask to get to the party? So what are some questions? If you're going to a party, what questions would you have to ask? Where is it? Who's going to be there? Do I bring anything? What time is it? How do, how do I get there? Is my ex going to be there? Are all my exes going to be there? Important information you need to know if you're going to a party. So this is being able to ask questions and give answers. Right? So we have Tarzan, then we have getting to the party. And then we have 
what happened at the party last night. Okay, so everybody copycat. This is being able to tell a story that has past, present, and future tense. All right, past, present, and future tense. So this is um, past, present, or present, future tense. There's another technique I'm going to interject right here. This is a technique. How fascinating. How fascinating. Okay. Technique. How fascinating. Technique. How fascinating. So this is a technique that I messed it up there because I was doing this for present. This is present. But how fascinating. So whenever we make a mistake, we do how fascinating. Um, the reason being, at some point in our lives, either because of school or society, we were taught that making a mistake is a wrong thing to do. At some point, we were taught that. And what happens is our mind thinks it's a wrong thing to do. And so we have a phys negative physical reaction to it when we make mistakes. And the other thing is that we are really hard on others when they make mistakes. Because we think it's a wrong thing to do, so if somebody else makes a mistake, they did something wrong. And when we make a mistake, we feel like we did something wrong. So a technique how fascinating is to change our thinking about that so that making mistakes becomes a positive thing. It's fascinating. So we physically, we open up our bodies, we like make our faces really big, and we go, how fascinating. <laughs> so whenever we make a mistake, that's what we do. And so how fascinating that I made a mistake. So we have Tarzan getting to the party and what happened at the party last night. So this is being able to tell a story with past, present, and future tense. This is also being able to tell about, like, talk about myself, you, he, she, they, them, us, we, all that kind of stuff, right? First person, second person, third person. So I'll give you an example. So last night, I went to this party and Tarzan showed up. I got way out of hand. Tarzan got so drunk, he threw uh, the couch through the window. And then the cops, somebody called the cops, and the cops came, and they dragged Tarzan away. So then this morning, present tense, Tarzan calls me up and says, hey, bro, I need you to bail me out of jail. I don't know who taught him that, but somebody did. <laughs> and, and so he calls me and says, hey, bro, I need you to bail me out of jail. And so I'm sitting there thinking, okay, I'm going to have to go, so future tense, I'm going to have to go to my mom's place, ask her if I can borrow $400, and then drive downtown in traffic and pick up Tarzan. So there's a the short little story that has past, present, and future tense, right? Telling stories, right? So we have Tarzan getting to the party. And what happened at the party last night? And then we have what if parties were illegal? What if parties were illegal? If parties were illegal, how would that impact our economy? If parties were illegal, how would that impact our politics, our society, our culture? If birthday parties were illegal, if, if um, anniversary parties were illegal, if Halloween was illegal, anything, right? Parties were illegal. How would that impact us? So this is different than storytelling. This is being able to talk about society from like a, a kind of a, a God's eye view of the world and saying, you know, if this happened here, it would impact these things. You know, it's being able to have an opinion and then back it up with a structured arguments. Right? I believe in this, and it's for these reasons. Right? That's different than storytelling. I might drop into story to be able to back up my argument, right? that's anecdotal evidence, or I can tell a story about this time that this happened to me, and that's why it reinforces this belief. So I can jump back and forth. But that's, you know, what if parties were illegal? So let's go through it again. We have Tarzan getting to the party. What would happen at the party last night? And what if parties were legal? So this is the roadmap to fluency. Okay? So I want everybody put your put your fingers up, your roadmap up. Point to where you are at in the English language. In the English language, where are you at? And everybody look around. To where everybody's at. Okay. Point to where you're at with um, cooking. Um, point to where you are at with activism. If you've, if, if you've ever done a hey, hey, ho, ho chant, you're right here. <laughs> okay, just so you know. Um, point to where you're at with... Um, 
psychology. <laughs> Point are you at with uh, linguistics? Cool. Point you are at uh, with French. This is the thing. If you know one word in a language, you're right here. If Tarzan can say one thing in a language, he's still, you know, Tarzan. Bonjour, bonjour, bonjour. <laughs> if you can say one word, you're in that language. Um, point to where you're at with Spanish. Point to where you're at with Salish. The Salish language. Point to where you're at with uh, Quacola. We've never even heard of it. <laughs> um, point to where you're at with the Squamish language. Right. So if you know one word in the Squamish language. So, this is the roadmap to fluency. Okay, so how fascinating. fascinating! We also do how fascinating when we succeed at learning something. So how fascinating! So one of the things that I, I teach in the in the language classes that I do, and with the community that I, I'm language community that I'm building, is that you know when we're learning languages, or when, when we're learning anything really, you know, if we're going to learn, um, say, basket weaving, and say we're going to invite the world's greatest basket maker to come to a workshop. World's greatest basket maker. World's greatest Coast Salish basket maker. What's most likely going to happen is she's going to bring her m amazing basket. And you're going to see what a perfected Coast Salish basket looks like. But so often with learning languages, we don't know what a finished basket looks like. We don't know what that you know, end goal can be. And if we don't know what the end goal can be, we don't know how to get there. So this is the roadmap that we use to get there. There's another way of explaining this. Um, there's a couple ways of explaining this. I'll get you guys to copycat this one. You got Sesame Street, Dora the Explorer, um, Peter Mansbridge. He kind of goes up here, but mostly is here. One-on-one -on -one with Peter Mansbridge, that's about here. Oprah Winfrey is also here. And then you got uh, Charlie Rose. Who knows who Charlie Rose is? Cool. I think I, th that's the first time I've asked that question, and more than two people's hands have gone up. <laughs> um, so Charlie Rose is an American broadcaster. He has an oak desk in a black room, and he gets on, like, you know, presidents and CEOs and the Shah of Iran, and you'll ask, like, a president the question, like, how does the trade agreement between the European Union and China going to affect the economy of British Columbia? I have no idea. But he asks questions like that, right? That's, you know, up here. So that's Charlie Rose level. Right? Sesame Street, what do you learn when you watch Sesame Street? Alphabet, numbers, counting, right? One, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, two, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. All right, Dora the Explorer. It's like, who could that be? Like, let's go see who's at the door. And like, where are we going today? All right, lots of question and answer, back and forth. There's Dora. Then you get like Oprah Winfrey, who asks you questions like, well, how did it feel to win that award for the tenth time? Right, so she's asking you feeling questions. She wants you to go into your heart and talk about your feelings and what that experience was like, and you know, talk about the story and all that kind of stuff. And then you got Charlie Rose who asks those Charlie Rose type questions. So that's the other way. There's another way, really boring way. This is this m technique is based off of the ACTFL proficiency scale guidelines. So there's a novice, intermediate, advanced, and superior. So anybody that's familiar with ACTFL, that's what we've uh, based this on. And we did it that way so that we could teach kids, you know, Charles of Charlie. Because if kids can understand it, then anybody can understand it. And we needed a way that we can engage people that it would be easy for them to remember what the roadmap is. And so the, how do you get here in the language is the question. How can I have this conversation in the language? But the thing that's going to happen is that this conversation in Squamish is going to be really different than it is in English. If I were to ask and have a conversation like, how has residential schools impacted our culture and language? If I was to have that conversation in the Squamish language, it's going to be really different than I have it in English. The concepts, the words, the references, it's going to be really different. And so the question I ask people is, would you rather learn to talk about your language, or would you rather learn to talk in your language? And if you really want to talk about your language, then wouldn't you rather do that in the language? Because so many of our language revitalization programs are learning to talk about the language. This is my thing about linguistics. 
Linguistics is not the study of how to build language community, language fluency community. It's a study of language. I could talk to you for hours about the Squamish language, and you would learn all kinds of cool, fascinating things, and then you'd walk out, but you would never remember a single word in the language. You could, you'd learn things about the language, and I could talk to you about the language for hours, but you would never learn to speak the language. So speaking about the language, talking about the language, is different than speaking the language. The other one that too that gets in there is that there's, you know, talking about the language, speaking the language. The other one is translating. Translating is like another completely separate skill from talking about the language or speaking it. Translating is another skill that's completely different. That's why some people, you know, you ask them to translate things, they're not quite sure how to translate it because there's more going on that with translation. And so this is the thing that I say about revitalizing languages and why our languages are in the state they are. How many people graduate from the SFU with a linguistics degree every year? How many people graduate, let's expand it to say SFU and UBC, every year with a, either undergrad or a graduate degree or PhD in linguistics? How many people uh, in BC? How many people in Canada? How many people across North America, the world, every year with linguistics degrees? which is, like I said, linguistics is the study of, the scientific study of languages. So for the past 50, 40 years, we've had how many people graduate linguistics degrees? Then why are languages still dying? If linguistics was the way to save our languages, wouldn't languages not be in the state of extinction that they are? Wouldn't they be, wouldn't you be hearing like everybody's, oh, everybody's, all the native people, yeah, they still speak our language. They came back like 40 years ago. And my thing is, I don't have a problem with linguistics. I actually find linguistics really fascinating. I find it like really cool to talk about it and think about how the language breaks down. But I find that most people aren't interested. Like most people in the community that are learning, that they're not learning the language so they can talk about it. They're not learning the language so they can tell you what a suffix is and a prefix is and what a uh, what a um, conjugated verb is and what a uh, subject agreement is and what a uh, possessive pronoun is and all these kinds of stuff. But a lot of language programs focus on that kind of stuff, and they focus on the linguistics. They focus on the translation. And so in order to decolonize, and, like, and one of the ways that we decolonize is by revitalizing our language, regenerating, and removing English, is by becoming fluent. Because if we really want to revitalize a language where it's in a place where it's alive, where it's thriving, that means you have a language community of fluent speakers. And one of the coolest things I ever heard about uh, a language that's revitalizing is, is the Maori language in New Zealand, in Aotearoa, in New Zealand, was that my friend was telling me about the first uh, Maori um, academic who did his PhD, and I can't remember his name, I'll have to get it at some point, but um, did his PhD in his language, they did the whole thing in his language. It was the first time that a PhD had ever been done in, in the Maori language. In, what was really cool about it was that the PhD, his, his dissertation was a linguistics degree. He was doing his PhD in linguistics, so he decided, like, if I'm going to do a linguistics degree in my, on my language, wouldn't it make sense to do it in my language? And so what he actually did was he created um, terms, um, I imagine he probably colonized the language a little bit by doing this, but he created terms in the language to talk about the language in the language. So instead of, you know, how do you translate the word verb, or a noun, or adjective, a pronoun, adverb, suffix, prefix, possessive. Like, how do you, how, if those concepts and those words don't exist in your language, how do you make them up? So they actually he created a bunch of these words to talk about verbs in the Maori language. And the word for verb actually breaks down to meaning, you know, when you hear the word that he created for verb, it means something like, you know, the th it, it is doing something. So when you hear that word, that image of something being done comes to mind. So he actually created like all these terms to, to be able to talk about the language. So that's the thing. If we really want to talk about the languages, if linguistics is the coolest thing in the world, that's awesome. But why don't we do that in the language? Why don't we talk? Why don't we get fluent? And then I can have a conversation with you about how cool the Squamish language is and all these neat things about it. Because if we're if we're if we're just talking about the language, we're not revitalizing it. And our, like I said, our languages are dying. We, the, the, the clock is still ticking. My language is, is one of the most endangered languages, and many are in BC. Some have, you know, maybe a, a dozen or two dozen speakers left. Some have more than that. I'd be grateful to have two dozen speakers in my language. 
but I don't. And so we're working really hard to revitalize it. And part of revitalizing it, um, like I said, is not to be able just to speak the language, is to be able to connect with something much more deeper than that. The other part that happens with language revitalization is you, you, know, you see a lot of things around um, apps and technology. There's kind of this thinking that uh, I find very somewhat offens offensive, which is like, oh, youth, they, they all have cell phones, they all have iPhones, they all have I iPads. Like, if we just make technology that they're, for them on the stuff they're using with the language, then they'll learn the language and then we're saving the language. And that, w that way of thinking obviously doesn't work. I've never heard of anybody becoming fluent in the language from an app. Maybe there is. I just never, I've never heard of anybody becoming fluent in a language from a language app. As cool as a language app is, as fascinating as it is, I've never heard it happen. So why are we spending millions of dollars on apps? On revi if we really are committed to revitalizing languages, why are we spending that much money on apps? Why are we spending that much money on technology that's not about creating fluency? Why are we spending so much time and resources getting degrees in linguistics when linguistics is a study of language, not the study of revitalizing language community? The other part of it is that as we become you know, knowledgeable about these ty other ways of thinking like linguistics, we do colonize the language. We do colonize it and introduce these concepts and try to break down the language and put it back together and all that kind of stuff. And we start losing some of that, those aspects and those, those concepts of the language. So the, the one last concept that I want to leave everybody with, um, I've gone over time, sorry. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Um, the last concept I want to leave you with is this concept around uh, identity and why I feel language is so important in, 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 in decolonizing. If I take a, I take a glass cup, for example, and when we cut, this is a concept that I, I learned from, from uh, Chris, Winant Chris Winantanana, who's a, a Maori writer who uh, did a really awesome book on, revitalize, on, on the history of revitalization in Aotearoa around the, on the Maori language. And he talks about this, which is, you know, identity is really complex and it's really dynamic. It's fluid, what our identity is. So his thing was that, you know, and I'll adapt it to my context, you know, being Squamish doesn't mean, like, you can be Squamish and not speak the Squamish language. That is possible, right? And so what he said is that you, when we come into this world, we come into this world as an empty cup. We come in with form, there's shape, there's, there's a vessel in which we inhabit, there's something already here. And then as we start to grow from when we're a newborn and start growing, we start progressing in our life, there is new things that we start learning as a human being. And new things start getting introduced to us. So we start learning who our first thing we learn is who our parents are. So that cup fills up a little bit. And then we start learning who our grandparents are and our siblings up and it fills up a bit more. And then eventually we start learning um, concepts, like ownership, perhaps. We start learning things like songs. We start learning things like, you know, play, what is play? Eventually, we start learning things like the rules of our society. We start learning language and culture. And so that cup keeps filling up every time we're learning something that adds into our mix, that dynamic. That's, it's all mixing up. It's all fluid. It's all dynamic. And it's all mixing up. And so it starts filling up more and more and more. And so eventually, you know, we become older and our cup has filled up with quite a bit of experience, quite a bit of knowledge, quite a, you know, life challenges as well as other things. And so his thing was, which I really agree with, is that when we learn language, indigenous languages, we are filling that cup up with so much of what it means to be indigenous. Because I could fill my cup up if I was, you know, a lot of our people were taken either through the residential schools and then later the 60s scoop when uh, indigenous children were removed from indigenous communities and put in non-native homes and raised as, uh, in an attempt to assimilate by raising these indigenous children in non-native homes with, you know, Euro-Canadian values your cup would fill up with values and beliefs and concepts that are not indigenous. And so if I want to be more Skhotmish, I want to fill my cup up with more Skhotmish ways of doing things. And the language is one of the things that I can fill it up with the most, that it's going to connect everything else. It's not the only thing, but it's one of the things that I can connect with the most. And so that's why, you know, it, 
bringing back these concepts and bringing back these ways of thinking and becoming fluent again and revitalizing fluency, I feel is so important because we fill that cup up with something that is so important to being Skolmish. And so that's part of the work around, you know, decolonization, one aspect of it. It's just like in the forest that, you know, I'm, I'm going to be one tree among many in the process of bringing back the forest after a forest fire. I'm going to be one. I mean, I'm not even a tree. I'm not even that good. I'm just going to be like a bush. I'm just a little bush doing my thing. I'm a huckleberry bush. There's dozens of other huckleberry bushes. I'm making way for the, you know, the big um, hemlocks and, and the, the other trees that are going to be coming soon. And eventually I'm going to like fade away and there are not going to be any huckleberry bushes in the old growth forest, but I'll set that up, right? I'm setting it up for something else. And I'm both regenerating my culture, but also working to remove the colonialisms that exist within the community, either physical or intellectual, cultural, social, spiritual, whatever it is, right? That's, that's how we accomplish it. And we all accomplish it by just doing our little piece of it and doing it along the way. Not one of us can do it all, all at once, and not one of us can do everything as a part of that at, at, at all. I can do language revitalization. I can't do everything. There's all other ways in which we can decolonize. So that's just one of them. And that's one of the things that I've attached on to. One of the things I tell people when I work in language revitalization is that if I'm doing this for the rest of my life, that means I didn't succeed, in my opinion anyways. If I'm doing this for the next you know, 60 years or whatever, that means I didn't succeed, in my opinion. I don't want to be doing this for the rest of my life. Not because I don't love it. I love, this is my, I love doing this. I love doing language work. But because I need to set up the next generation so that this is moving along differently. That the next forest that becomes where we're at is different than what we have today. That's my goal, and that's what I hope to achieve. So thank you. <laughs>